Thanks. Well, Thank you, uh, Ashraf, and uh, good afternoon, <coughs> everyone. Just, uh, I do not have any conflict of interest for this uh, lecture. Uh, you, you will see that uh, when we speak about the RV function and the management of fluids, we need to speak about physiology and apply physiology at bedside. And I want just to start with this very old paper from Patterson and Starling, 1914, so many, many years ago. It was a very complex uh, experimental study, but you have the main result here of this study. On the x-axis, you have the flow, the inflow or the outflow of the Harvey. Uh, just to summarize uh, what they did, they progressively filled the Harvey and they just look at how many, how much the blood was ejected into the pulmonary circulation. This is on the same axis because the inflow and the outflow by definition are, uh, are the same. And on the y axis, you have the right atrial pressure. The first information that you uh, get from this uh, uh, figure is that when you uh, increase the inflow and as a consequence, the outflow, the right ventricle is unable to generate a significant increase in right atrial pressure. So it means that the main role of the right ventricle is to maintain as low as possible the right atrial pressure to promote the systemic venous return. If you continue to feel the Harvey, the second information that you have is that now you increase significantly the right atrial pressure. So you overcome the uh, cutoff uh, value uh, and you stress the right ventricle. And finally, at the end, if you continue to feel the Harvey, you induce Harvey failure. As you observe now, a decrease in the RV inflow and outflow. And this information is key because it just show you that if you uh, induce fluid overload, you may uh, lead to RV failure just because you gave too much fluid. We have the same uh, uh, data in uh, humans. I like this study from the group of Sheldon Magder. You have here the right atrial pressure and you have here the cardiac output. Here, this is in normal, uh, in healthy volunteers during exercise. And you observe that when you uh, uh, perform exercise, you increase a lot the cardiac output, but without any significant or big change in the right atrial pressure, because you have a good adaptation of the RV function. If you look at now patient after heart transplantation, now this is completely different because when they did exercise, first they were unable to go as much as the normal suggests in terms of cardiac output. And second, the price to pay was a significant increase in the right atrial pressure. So something suggesting a certain degree of RV failure. So as you know, the systemic venous return is very well uh, represented by uh, Arthur Guyton, 1957, uh, with this uh, uh, systemic venous return uh, curve. You have the right atrial pressure here. You have the systemic venous return here. And so higher is the right atrial pressure, lower is the systemic venous return. At that point, there is no more systemic venous return it means that there is no more cardiac output and there is a cardiac arrest. This is when the right atrial pressure is equal to the mean systemic feeling pressure. And so you know that from this curve, it's, uh, we are able to, uh, to say that the systemic venous return is proportional to a pressure gradient, which is the difference between the mean systemic feeling pressure, the pressure, the the forward pressure for the systemic venous return minus the right atrial pressure, which is the backward pressure, and divided by the resistance, the venous resistance to flow. For instance, a situation where it's not RV failure, but uh, it's a good illustration that uh, here, this is cardiac tamponade. You see that the right atrial pressure is very high but only uh, due to the transmission of the pericardial pressure, P. 
which is also very high. And so if you do the difference between both, this is near zero. It means that there is at least no distending pressure uh, uh, of the right atrial, of the right atrium, no blood into the right atrium. And this is exactly what you see when you perform an echo. The right ventricle and the right atrium are completely compressed by the fluids into the pericardium. And the IVC in this situation is significantly dilated. Look at when this patient, we did some fluid removal. You observed a decrease and a normalization of the pericardial pressure, now close to the intrathoracic pressure. So the pressure is negative, which is normal. And you see as a consequence, a decrease in the right atrial pressure. But now the situation is much better for the patient as you have some distending pressure, which is the uh, uh, difference between both the right atrial and the surrounding pressure, which is the pericardial pressure. And so now you have some blood into the uh, right heart because of this decrease uh, in the obstruction. One uh, uh, word uh, very quickly about the venous resistance, just to show you from another uh, paper uh, of uh, Arthur Guyton, the relationship between the uh, resistance here, and so the venous resistance here, and the systemic venous return or the cardiac output, which, which is the same. And you observe that when the venous resistance increase, you decrease the uh, systemic venous return. And this is exactly what happens uh, about the, uh, if you look at the uh, vena cava and especially the super vena cava. So I will not speak about the super vena cava because I know that Daniel De Becker will show you later a, a short lecture about uh, how using the vena cava uh, evaluation for managing fluids. But just to show you that for the super vena cava is uh, submitted to the intrathoracic pressure and could be the point where, uh, for instance, during TADI ventilation, you may have some uh, collapse and some increase in the venous resistance uh, to flow. And so some decrease in the systemic venous return. So from this, uh, from this uh, view, you have, as you, as you know, uh, three parameters, the SVC respiratory variation, the IVC respiratory variation, but also the N expiratory diameter of the intravena cava. And I show only a few slides very quickly. About the supravena cava, I think what, what is interesting is that this is something that you may evaluate according to the respiratory seating. Look at here, this patient in PIP0, the pulse pressure variation in 9%, the cardiac index is 3.7. If you look at by TEE, uh, you have uh, only a slight decrease in the RV uh, stroke volume during TADI ventilation, and at least uh, no collapse of the supravena cava also. So you may consider that this situation is under control in terms of fluid management. But because the patient was severely hypoxemic, we decided to apply a PIP of five to improve, let's say, the lung recruitment and to optimize the blood gases. And look at now uh, the pulse pressure variation. The delta PP was 11%. The cardiac index dropped to 2.5. And look at now, this is completely different. You observe the huge drop in the RV stroke volume during each TADI ventilation. And now, indeed, a complete collapse of the supravena cava also during each TADI ventilation. So from this stage with this approach, you have two uh, solutions. The first one is to remove the PIP, or the second one is to consider that the patient really need a PIP of five and maybe to perform some fluid expansion. And this is what we did. And look at now how uh, increased the blood pressure, no more pulse pressure variation. The cardiac index increased from 3.7 in zip to 4.5 uh, with the PIP of five after fluid expansion. And so no more respiratory variation. And you will see at least no more collapse of the supravena cava. So this is a way you may use this kind of approach, which is uh, uh, what is the effect of the mechanical ventilation 
on the uh, preload of the right ventricle on the right heart to have an idea how to manage in live because we left the T probe inside the patient during each steps just to look at and to monitor what we did. Just one slide about the infer vena cava and especially the N expiratory diameter. This is something that we uh, evaluated in this uh, multicenter uh, uh, prospective studies, including 540 patients with shock, all mechanically ventilated. And uh, our, uh, 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 the goal of this ancillary, ancillary sorry, study was to evaluate the ability of the uh, diameter of the IVC to predict fluid responsiveness or fluid unresponsiveness. Just to show you first, and this is, I think, a, an important information in relation to a question that you asked to Xavier, that IVC was not obtained in 22% of patients. So this is a true life because the patient was obese, because of high P, because of fluid overload, whatever the cause. If you look at the relationship between the right atrial pressure in the y-axis and the diameter of the IVC, you observed in all the patients some relation. So it was uh, uh, significant statistically uh, correlated, but look at that uh, uh, for one patient, we had really a, a, a huge uh, difference in terms of right atrial pressure. What uh, was especially important is that in the subgroup of patients, with increased abdominal pressure, we did not report anymore a relationship between the right atrial pressure and the diameter of the infravena cava. So what about the main result uh, uh, of this study? Here, this is the ability, the specificity of the diameter of the IVC to predict fluid responsiveness. And you see that uh, uh, below, let's say 13 millimeters, the specificity was 180%. Here, this is the specificity of the diameter to predict the unresponsiveness. And you observe that above 25 millimeters, uh, we had a specificity of 80%. So this is something you may use. But just to show you that uh, uh, most of patients, let's say 71% of patients were in between with a diameter between 13 and 25. So you have the solution for a few number of patients, but most of patients were in between, so in the gray zone. Look at, for instance, this one that's of use. The high VC is very small, much lower than 13 millimeters. The VTI is 10 centimeter. And look at after uh, two steps of read expansion, the VTI increased at 13 and the IVC diameter was uh, uh, normalized or even maybe a little bit dilated. Look at this one, the IVC was dilated at baseline. And so we decided for other reasons, not only based on the IVC, and not through the expansion and look at the normalization of the IVC diameter. Probably that in this situation, or not probably it was the case, the patient had a biventricular failure, the LV and the RV in relation to a septic shock. So now what about the uh, RV uh, itself? Uh, just uh, we need to uh, try to define what is RV failure. And I show you that from this uh, expert uh, paper, RV failure may be defined finally as a very big R, uh, RV, which is required to maintain a certain cardiac output. So look at, for instance, here, the, this is transthoracic echo. The RV is much bigger than the LV. This is a patient with a massive pulmonary embolism. And you observe the mobile clot into the right atrium. Or here you have Harvey failure in this patient ventilated for severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is TE. The Harvey is much bigger than the LV, which is completely compressed. And this Harvey failure is really key if you want to um, manage adequately the need for fluids. Look at, for instance, we know with many, many uh, papers that first, RV failure or RV dilatation may limit the efficacy of volume expansion. 
and I will show you later that even it may be deleterious for the RV to give too much fluids as suggested on my first slide. Look at, for instance, here, this is in septic shock. This is not echo. It was a transpulmonary thermodilution. You have the size of the RV in the responders to fluids and the size of the RV in the non-responders to fluids. And uh, they observed a significant difference between both. So bigger was the RV, lower was the response to fluids. 1988. We have uh, another uh, information in another situation, which is a uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. So 1999 from Bicetre uh, uh, group, Alain Merca. And this is here a uh, um, fast uh, response uh, pulmonary artery catheter. And this is the change in cardiac index after fluid expansion. One. So again, bigger was the RV before fluid expansion, lower was the increase in cardiac index after fluid expansion. And we have very nice studies, experimental study, as just show you one, but there are a few uh, about the uh, effect of fluid expansion in a, a model of uh, pulmonary embolisms in animals. This is here baseline. This is the obstruction of the pulmonary circulation. This is after giving fluids. And this is after infusing norepinephrine. First, you observed during the uh, uh, PE uh, uh, step, a decrease in the cardiac output, a decrease in the stroke volume, and a significant increase in the right ventricular and diastolic pressure because they induced RV failure. What happens when they infuse more volume? You can see it's really important to, to, to have this point in mind. The cardiac output uh, decreased more as well as the stroke volume and the right, ventricle, uh, the right ventricular and diastolic pressure increased more. So they stressed more the right ventricle with deleterious effect on the hemodynamics. And this is only the infusion of norepinephrine, which was able to increase the cardiac output, the stroke volume, and decrease the right ventricular and diastolic pressure. In this uh, recent paper that we published in patients with septic shock, uh, 282 patients, all mechanically ventilated, we try to, uh, uh, sorry, we try to combine uh, RV size uh, using the echocardiographic approach with the measurement of the CVP as a surrogate of the right atrial pressure. And our hypothesis was that the combination, the association of RV dilatation plus high CVP, elevated CVP, was a good definition of RV failure. Because as I told you, or maybe not, uh, when you have RV failure, you have some systemic congestion with elevated CVP, uh, increased creatinine, and so on, and some renal, uh, renal congestion. So look at. Uh, uh, we have one group without any RV dilatation. It was 41% of cases. We have a second group with some RV dilatation and the echo, but the CVP lower than eight millimeters of mercury. So probably not RV failure, but maybe something in progress. This is 17% of cases. And we had a third group with RV dilatation plus a CVP at least higher than eight millimeters of mercury, it was 42% of cases, and we considered this group as probably having RV failure. Why did we uh, take this uh, cutoff value of eight millimeters of mercury of CVP? First, why the CVP? For instance, you have this uh, nice study just showing uh, according to different range of CVP, the uh, percentage of acute kidney injury in patients hospitalized in the ICU. You observe no difference whatever the cutoff value. But what was especially interesting in this study is that they found an association per one centimeter of water increase in the CVP. So for each increase in CVP of one centimeter, they were able to uh, demonstrate a significant increase 
in the incidence of acute kidney injury. The second study is especially interesting. So this is more cardiological patients, 145 patients with a pulmonary artery catheter, just to show you the rock curve, the area under the rock curve for the worsening of renal function during the admission in the uh, uh, intensive care. And the CVP was a much better predictor, for instance, than the cardiac index in red. You have here the same information. Here, this is the low cardiac index without uh, no effect on the uh, uh, glomerular filtration rate, providing that the CVP was low. It was not the case here, despite a high cardiac index, but because the CVP was high, they were able to report a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. And it was especially as shown here when uh, they observed a persistently elevated CVP higher than eight millimeters of mercury at the time, at the time sorry, of the pack removal. It was strongly associated with the incidence of worsening renal function. So just a reflection finally of RV function with consequence on the kidney. And in this paper, we were able to report not uh, the size of the RV, uh, the response to the passive leg rising as a surrogate of fluid expansion and the CVP, because it was too complicated with the pulse pressure variation to associate in only one figure. But we were uh, able to report here the size of the RV, the pulse pressure variation here, and in color, the, um, for instance, when the color was orange, it means that patients were very likely to respond to a passive leg rising in terms of increased cardiac output. And when the color was uh, uh, red, uh, was uh, sorry, green, it means that patients were, were very unlikely to respond to a passive leg rising. And this is especially interesting here that you can see that despite significant pulse pressure variation, providing that the RV was significantly and uh, uh, severely dilated, we did not have any response to fluids or it was very unlikely that the patient were responders to fluids. And this is something that you may observe sometime if you look at uh, with caution, uh, the pulse pressure variation and the echo at the bedside. Look at here, this patient ventilated for severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. The cardiac index is very low. So the patient is a very in a bad hemodynamic shape. You observe that the pulse pressure variation was significant. I do not remember, it was around 20 or 25%. If you look at now the effect of mechanical ventilation and especially TADI ventilation using TEE on the RV stroke volume, you observed of indeed a decrease in the RV stroke volume, especially at the plateau here compared to the expiration. So a very bad effect of mechanical ventilation on the RV function, but probably, and it was not the case here, not corrected by giving more fluids because you have here the T just showing that the RV was much bigger than the LV completely compressed. The right atrium was severely dilated with the bulging of the interatrial septum toward the left atrium. So a good reflection that the pressure into the right heart was very uh, elevated. And sorry here, I cannot give you the right atrial pressure of the CVP. And that's it for my presentation. I thank you for your attention. You may look at this uh, website, you have the uh, email address uh, this is in French or in English, and you have many informations about the echo regarding the heart-lung interaction, the evaluation of RV function, uh, cardiac tamponade, and so on. Thank you, and uh, I may uh, wait for your questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation, uh, my dear Antoine, as usual. And uh, if I have question, I don't see any question yet, but let me ask the question of the debates in the literature about the RV dysfunction patients. When you go and try to test their fluid responsiveness, 
using, for example, the pulse pressure variation, there are some few evidence saying that you might get false results because of RV dysfunction. What's your input on this point, Dr. Antoine Bon? Again, the RV dysfunction, and you want to predict their fluid responsiveness. Uh, I think this is not uh, really a debate for me. This is just, uh, I try to show you just physiology. And uh, maybe my, my uh, lecture could end at the, at the end after the first slide, because everything was demonstrated in 1914 by Patterson and Starling, just showing the relationship between inflow and flow, outflow of the RV and right atrial pressure. And that's very obvious that we know all that the RV uh, is a very uh, um, a big uh, limitant factor uh, for the response to fluids. So a low, a worst is the RV function, a lower is the response to fluids. Uh, great. Uh, if, if you have any question, we'll lead in the board from the attendees or just I go and ask, ask another question. We still have two minutes. Yeah, there is a question here. How can we decide in case of concomitant tricuspid valve disease? If what, <clears throat> what we decide about uh, the management in, in fluids? Yes, if you, if, if you have a concomitant tricuspid valve disease like severe TR and IVC congestion and that stuff, how can you make your mind? Usually you when you have a severe, severe TR, you have, uh, especially when it is chronic, you have some RV failure or at least RV overload, diastolic overload. So it is probably very unlikely that the patient is a responder to fluids. And this is much better to try to optimize the pressure into the right heart to decrease the tricuspid regurgitation and maybe to think about the repair of the tricuspid valve. But probably in this situation, most of the time, the RV is dilated and sometime or most of the time with an elevated CVP. So no, no fluids, probably. Perfect. OK, so um, I think we are going fantastic with our timetable so far. It's my honor and pleasure to go to the next uh, speaker. Here.